Um, this morning, I want to talk about a whole bunch of P's because it's easier to remember. And instead of reading to you the whole chapter of the book of Acts, and some of you would leave if I did that, I'm going to read one verse and I'm going to summarize several chapters that are going to help you understand. And this message, if you apply it, works for your own life as well as a corporate life of this church. If this is your first time worshiping with us, thank you so much. Virtual hugs to you if this is your first time. If this is your first time watching with us online, just put first. Uh, if this is your first time worshiping with us in a sanctuary, before I ask this so you're not afraid, I'm not going to ask you who invited you. I'm not going to ask you what church you came from. I'm not going to ask you, are you born again? I'm just going to wave at you and just tell you thank you for coming. If this is your first time worshiping with us, would you do me a favor? And just wave at me that I might acknowledge you if you're in the sanctuary. God bless you. 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 Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. Listen, we have gifts for you. We have gifts for you in your honor. We thought about you. So when you go to the lobby, our helps team will be out there to say, hey, I'm a first time guest. And we got gifts for you. We, we, we bought gifts for you. That's how much we thought about you and you're coming. Hopefully you'll consider making this your home church. Can't make you join, but love to have you join. I want to read Acts 17 verse 6 out of the New King James Version. It's the only time I'm going to read it because I like it out of that version better. It says this, these are they that turn the world upside down. These are they that turn the world upside down. These are they that turn the world upside down. Acts was written by Luke, the physician. He writes about Acts because that's how the church starts. The inception of the church begins in the book of Acts. And why God left the church in the earth is so the church could represent God's kingdom in the earth. You don't need to wait on government. We are the church. And what others cannot do, we can do collectively. Somebody say amen. So now, I, I know a lot of you have goals, and that's important. But goals not aligned with God is just idolatry. So I want to kind of help you navigate, even on your own, how to lean into your goals and how the church as well is going to lean into their goals. So as the church goes ahead, you're following. I dedicated two houses this week of individuals that bought, purchased during a pandemic. And they said, well, Pastor, if the church could buy in a pandemic, so could we. If the church had enough faith to move forward. So, so as the church infuses faith, you receive that faith and you use it in your own life. Church is no good if all you do is hear it and hear and not experience it in your own life. All right, so number, now Acts, I'm going to walk through the book of Acts. If you, if you listen to me, you'll basically know the book of Acts, the first seven or eight chapters. Acts chapter number one, Jesus is dead. He comes back to the earth, walks with them for 40 days because they're tripping. They're, they're shocked that their lives are going to start without help. And now Jesus says, listen, I'm going to walk with you all. And then after a while, he goes up in a whirlwind and they don't see him no more. But he says, what I'm going to do for you guys is I need you all to change the world. I'm not here anymore, but I need you to change the world. And I'm going to give you a house called the church where you can hear the word of God. It should inspire you. And then when you hear the word, you leave the church and you go out there and you change the world. Now, they used to worship on Saturday. But then they changed it in the book of Acts to start worshiping on Sunday because that's the day Jesus resurrected from the grave. They wanted to come to church on Sunday as a tribute or as a remembrance that this is the day the Lord got up, which is a good preaching part to let you know that no matter how bad your life may be going right now, Sunday is symbolic to let you know that you can still get up. I don't care if you have 300 as a credit score, you can still get up. I don't care if you've been diagnosed with a bad terminal sickness, you can still get up. I don't care if you're about to lose everything, you can still 
get up. And so here is what I want you to know. Before, hey, Pamela, Pamela White Sauce. First time guest online. Thank you for watching. Okay, anyway, um, so to let you know what Jesus says is this. I want you to follow these instructions through the church of Acts. And this will be how you will change the world. No, a lot of us want to change the world, but you can't change the world if you don't first change you. Right? So I can't be a world changer until I change me. So number one, God says, what I want you to do is before you do anything, world changers, you need to go up to the upper room. And all of y'all need to go up there. And, and a lot of them went and a lot of them left because they didn't want to do this step. They wanted to go change the world without doing this step. So you see 120 in the upper room, but there were more that were sent to the upper room. They just got tired of waiting, so they left the upper room, and only 120 stayed because some of them felt that that's not relevant enough. And in a culture that thinks that the way that you get ahead is by networking, that's not only the way you get ahead. Number one way, number one P is this, you need to pray. I don't care how successful you are. If you don't pray, you won't stay. You don't, you don't have to, let me tell you, if you pray well and you may not know anybody, God will send the right people that know you to present you to the right people. Come on, church. Like, I need some world changers that really believe. If I do my job well enough, God will raise up other people to find me and bring me into rooms that my feet have never been in. I've read John Maxwell for years. I don't know John Maxwell. I've read him for years. I've read, how many of you know John Maxwell, leadership guru? I got an email from somebody, a text message that said, hey, I see what you're doing in Orlando. It's incredible. Would you be interested to go sit at John Maxwell's house and just learn about leadership with him at his house? At first, I looked at him, I'm like, this can't be real. This must be spam. They must be fishing at me or all that type of stuff. And it was authentic. Why? Because when you do your job well, God will raise up other people to put you in spaces. It starts not by networking. It starts by... How did you get in the room? I don't know. I just prayed. I prayed that God will put my name in places that my talent can't get me into. God, I pray that you put me in places on the mind, on the hearts of people that I need to know that I don't know. I pray that I'll meet people in restaurants and opportunities. That's where prayer happens. And those that don't pray don't see the favor of God. I need you to go to the upper room and I need you to pray. And when you pray, number one, I need you to pray. That's Acts chapter number one. That's what I need you to do is I need you to pray. Then he says, okay, after you're done praying, I'm going to send you a partner, and the partner is going to be the Holy Spirit. Number two, the word is partnership. The word is partnership. I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit to partner with you because you can't change the world without a partner. Ooh, that's a good marriage point. You can't change the world without a partner. God didn't send you a marriage partner to be your adversary. They sent you a marriage partner to help you change the world. And you might be sitting here saying, well, I'm single, so God may have not. No, God knows everything that you need is already within you, and you're not waiting on someone to validate your existence. You're waiting on someone to add to their existence. No, baby, being married is not someone rescuing you from boredom. Because you should have enough purpose that you're married to in this season, that it doesn't deny that you want a spouse, but it does acknowledge that I'm not just miserable waiting on a spouse. Can I get a church from the single house to say that? I'm not waiting on some. I'm, I'm, I'm in my purpose, and as I do my purpose, God will send me the right partner that can help be a destiny partner to my future. I'm not marrying just hips, lips, and fingertips. You need that. 
but I'm marrying a destiny partner too. Someone that's going to take me somewhere. Someone that's going to lead me somewhere. I don't need someone that's just going to make love to me. I need someone that's going to give me life. Come on, church. Number two is partnership. I'm going to give you a partner, and here's what we need to learn. Partnership doesn't always come in the way we think. We're sitting up there praying that God sends us help. He don't send us somebody that is six foot nine. He doesn't send us someone that's five foot three. He sends a spirit to come help us. And this spirit is invisible, but it's visible. It's going to live in you, but it's going to work through you. This spirit is like alcohol. <laughs> Heard the church go, silence. That's what Paul alludes to when he says, be filled with the spirit. Be controlled by the spirit. When you drink alcohol... You don't necessarily see it go in you, but you feel it. And the longer you spend time with alcohol, the more it changes. Come on, y'all, with the bars at your house. The longer, I dedicated some of y'all houses. The longer you spend time with alcohol, the more it adjusts your behavior, the more it changes your walk, the more it changes your talk the more it changes your intuition. That's, that's what he's saying, partnership. Partnership. So it's important to know that God will send you partners that don't always look like you, that don't always sound like you, that don't always act like you. And sometimes you got to adjust who you are so we can partner. If you're not willing to adjust, then you won't grow. Number three. Now, when y'all in the upper room, Acts chapter number two, I need y'all to know how you're going to go out. So God gives them a plan. Don't just pray and not plan. I'm going to give you a plan. This is how the plan's going to work. This is how you're going to spread the gospel. You're going to go from here, from Judea to Samaria to the uttermost parts of the earth. Notice what he says. You're not going to go to the othermost parts of the earth first. You're going to go to Judea and Samaria, which means this. Stop trying to be national when you're not local. Because everybody wants to be global, but no one wants to win where they're at. Bloom where you're planted. Don't try to bloom in another garden and then mistreat this garden. Bloom where you're planted. Number three, or number four, they prepared their plans. They prepared their plans. They prepared their plans. Acts chapter number three, they prepared their plans. They said, we're going to start gathering. The, the church is where we're going to go to get instruction. It was called the Ecclesia. The ecclesia was mean the called out ones. The ecclesia was not just a place where they gathered to talk about spiritual things. They gathered to talk about politics in the ecclesia. They gathered to talk about natural things in the ecclesia. The ecclesia was like, I would say, I'm not trying to minimize what the church was in that call, but it was like a barbershop. Everything was held there. Everything was conversed there. There was a lot of discussion that happened in the ecclesia, and they would take what they heard, and they would use that to benefit their lives. Acts chapter number three. Number five or number four, number five. They positioned people. They started realizing in Acts chapter number 6 when they started choosing who's going to replace Judas because Judas decided to kill himself and now he's no longer the disciple. They started picking partners. And then they started casting lots to see who, who's going to be the partners that they picked. They started positioning people for the next assignment. People are your greatest resource. God 
will bless you and I through people. Some of you love God, you don't love people. You can't grow if you don't love people. And I don't care how bad somebody hurts you, and just because, I taught this last week, just because they hurt you doesn't mean that God will not send you another person that will heal the wounds that someone else did. If you're not open to receive new people, you're going to miss God's hand. But bro, I only vibe with people who, uh, 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 I only vibe. you're going to miss God's hand. Because some of the people that you think are loyal, they don't like you. That's why all of your enemies are their friends. You got to learn how to allow God to position you with people. You think God let you meet them by accident? There's a divine reason why God allowed you to meet them. And partnership with people is important. The $95,000 didn't come from someone I knew. It came from a member who worked at a job who called me and said, I was telling my boss about you, and he wants to talk to you about the church and what y'all doing. Well, the boss knew someone that was on our staff, Pastor Outing, and said, well, man, if Pastor Outing is there, then y'all good. Now, imagine we treated Pastor Outing bad. Because some of you treat people bad because you don't think they can help you. If you can't use their name to advance your career, you don't treat them right. You need to learn how to partner with people and put people in the right position. Now, this is going to get deep, but some of the relationships that you cut off, it wasn't their fault. You just positioned them wrong. Who's wrong? You or them. You knew they gossiped a lot, and you still told your business. Should you be mad at them because you fed their character default? Or should you take responsibility and say, maybe I should never put you in that position to give you that type of information and then turn around and call you an enemy? You got to learn how to position people. If I know you're going to pop off, then I don't need to take you to this party. I'm so sorry they jumped on you. I didn't know they were going to do that. I, you know, my cousin, they got 18 warrants, and I didn't know they were going to know. If you know your cousin likely to slice somebody, don't take them to a professional meeting. And then want to ask for grace and favor. You got to know where to bring people and where not to bring people. This is going to hurt, y'all. The next one is this. This is one that we have to learn. Acts chapter number 6 is where this happened in the church. Um, Acts 6 is, is an interesting passage because some of the people weren't getting served what they needed because the Hellenites weren't being served and then the apostles were missing out on people because some people were hooking up their homeboys and, and hooking up their homegirls and then some people weren't getting food because the church was a daily space that they brought food to. And so because they couldn't get food, the people started getting mad and saying, y'all disciples, y'all trying us. We, you know, when folk get hungry, they get, they get real ignorant. Even if they're from the suburbs, they get a little ghetto in them, you know, when they get hungry, right? And so they, they started getting upset because they, they here's the next P, you got to get over your prejudice, which means preconceived opinions that is not based on reason or actual experience. Man, I didn't want to talk to you because I felt like you were too big. You didn't experience that. That's what you thought. Somebody called me and said, hey, man, I, I love your church. Man, it's, it's great. It's, it's, a, it's a great black church. You ain't never been here. Now, it may be in a black area. It may be dominantly black people, but that doesn't mean that we want to just be only for black people. 
Don't preconceive being in Pine Hills to mean we only want to be for black people. We want to be a church for all people, which means I want my blacks to be good. And I want to champion black issues. I want my Latinas, Latinos to be good. You know, we want a merengue and salsa. We want, we want, we want all that. We want our Anglos to feel comfortable. Right? That doesn't mean I have to lessen my blackness to make you feel comfortable. And that doesn't mean you have to lessen who you are to make us feel comfortable. All of our experiences make us better. No, our church is in the hood, but you can come. I promise. We got security guards. Ain't nobody going to shoot on you. No one going to steal your car. I promise none of that stuff. Like, you can worship with us. We got to get rid of our prejudice. Can I ask you a question? How many people do you have in your phone that's of the opposite color? We got we to gotta change this prejudice. You know how we do? Your kid comes home and they got a friend. They're not your color. They're like, Dad, I'm about to bring John over. Oh, yeah, bring John over. Yeah, for sure. John comes over. You're like, well, John, what's going on here, man? What's his? Hey, hey. hey, I heard you're a pastor. Yeah, John, who are you? We, we got to get rid of our prejudice because there are a lot of people that could be a blessing to us. But because we're prejudiced, we prejudge people based on our experience. And just because it's your experience doesn't mean it's a reality. And it is true that there are experiences that you have that are realities that are denied by other people. But that doesn't mean that I need to treat everybody the same. They were doing this in the church. They were prejudiced in the church. Like, you and I got to learn how to adjust so that we can be good partners. A man came to the church this past week, good guy. He said, Pastor, I love the church. I even watched a sermon called Go to Hell. It's like, oh, man, that was bad. He said, but you know what? I just, I really love it. But I just wish it was a little softer for my ears. And you could get offended and be like, well, player, this is how we do it. You know what I'm saying? This is how we do it. We like, to, we like a little bass in our thing. You know what I'm saying? We like a little crumb. No, no. Or you could say, you know what? I, I, maybe I need to make some adjustments. Because remember, if you're a chef, you don't cook and eat what only you like. So you have to make adjustments that are uncomfortable for you for the ultimate good. Next is you got to be persuaded. Acts chapter number 7, Stephen gets stoned. He gets stoned because he believes that, I don't care if Steve Harvey tells you that there's more ways to God than one. You're wrong. Like, no, I'm persuaded that I would rather believe this Bible is true and believe there is a God and live my life that there is a God with all my conviction. My friend told me this. He said this to me, and it, it really moved me to my core. He said, David, he has like 10 kids or 11 with the same woman. They do a lot of touching and laying of hands. <laughs> A lot of anointing in that house. I said to him, he said, David, if a person got a gun and took it to my children and put it at their head and said, deny God or I'll kill your children. He said, I love my God so much, I'd say, it hurts me to see you do it. But you can pull that trigger. I was so moved by like, wow. Like you're so sold out that God forbid that doesn't happen but you're so committed to the gospel. You're so persuaded that God is good, that God will take care of your children on the other side. Like I was like, man, I don't, that's, that's deep. 
I mean, let's not fake it. Because I know all you be like, hey, I want to go to heaven. If we say, all right, all y'all that want to go to heaven, stand up here, we're going to kill you right now. See how it got quiet? Everybody's like, oh, you go first. Praise God, you go first. But think about it. He was so persuaded. He was so persuaded. Now, the next one is, this one's important. We got to be persuaded because a lot of people are going to start trying to shape what we should believe. Yeah, I mean, shoot, you know, you don't need to believe in God. I mean, you got to live your best life, period. <laughs> like, respectfully, right? That's, that's, how, that's, how, that's how everybody's trying to shape that the, that the way is wide. Like, bro, you can smoke weed and go to heaven. You can get high and get drunk and go to heaven. Like, God made the grass. Like, you can go to the club every single weekend. You just like music. <laughs> but you, you're not nasty looking at that pornography. It's art. But it's, 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 it's a widening of the road. Because the American gospel requires a crown without a cross. So player, you can get high and when you die, we're all going to stand over your casket and say you made it in. Because in reality, we don't believe there's a hell. That's why we act like everybody goes to heaven. Because we want to make it wide. Right? I'm not saying drinking is a sin, because they drunk, that's why you got to know the scripture. The meal of, the drink of choice at meals was wine. Yeah. Scripture even says a deacon, a bishop may not be given over to much wine, which means they drunk. I don't drink. I'm not using that as a statement to drink, okay? So I don't, I don't, he's not saying that drinking is bad. He's saying the excess of it. The buzz. You know what I'm saying? The buzz, you know what I'm saying? When you start, <laughs> I just had a little too much. <laughs> the buzz, right? The next, he, he says this, y'all too silly. He says this, this. Acts chapter number four, philosophy. Peter and John, they were being tried before the Sanhedrin because they weren't scared to address philosophy. And you know why people stop going to church? Because we're afraid to address philosophies that they have. Because people will say, well, you know, I'm a Christian. Okay, well, we need to define what Christianity is. Because you do know the slaves on the bottom of the boat were praying to Jesus. And the slave masters at the top were praying to Jesus too. So how do we reconcile the two? You got to be willing as a church to address hard issues that you are afraid of addressing. I believe I was born by the Big Bang Theory. That's cool. That's cute. But if you really believe that a human being was formed in a womb by a big bang and that when a woman has a baby she's able to breathe out that baby birth that baby out and then her breasts are able to produce milk and you believe that happened by coincidence if you believe by coincidence that the sun stands still long enough not to move too far to the right too far to the left because if it does it would kill the entire humanity and it will set itself if the waves would go too far beyond the shoreline it would take over the earth and God says if, if you believe that by coincidence that a rainbow happens to be in the sky as a testament that God says I'll never wipe this earth away with water and it never has happened since this rainbow has been in the sky then you go for it Like, you got to be willing to address issues and philosophies. 
And there's this whole idea in this culture that we live in that Christianity is an Anglo religion. Well, you do know that most of the fathers in the scripture were from Africa. So you got to help me reconcile how does that happen? I'm not talking about what you read on Google or jailhouse ministry. Because a lot of times these philosophies are birthed out of jail because they are captive for so long and they feel like they're enslaved and they feel like we need to find some sense of identity as God's people. And that's why Hebrew Israelites are so popular because African Americans feel like they've always been overlooked and now you finally got a religion that says you're God's chosen people. Well, if you read scripture throughout the entirety, you already know that you're God's chosen people because God died for you and said, I will not die just for the Gentiles, I'll die for the Jews and the Greek alike got to know philosophy and be able to address it. Lastly, and I'm done because y'all getting hungry and some of y'all want to go to the licking after service. Tell. <laughs> Philanthropy. Acts chapter number five. Which means this. They were so committed to seeing the city change that they would sell their property and give to the least of these. I'm so committed to seeing your life better, Acts chapter number five, that I will sell my property and give the proceeds to the church. So much so that there was a woman who walked in there and she sold real estate, made a commission off of it, and then God said, well, where's the portion of profit that you made off the sale of your property? She lied and said, uh, I didn't make enough, I didn't make anything, she died right there. And they dragged her out of the church because she didn't give what she said she made to the Lord. See, God has no problem prospering us, but the goal got to be right. No, you got to be prosperous so you can eat. You got to be prosperous so you can take care of your family. But at some point, it's got to be bigger than you. And lastly, this is the word praise. Throughout Acts and the entirety of Acts, Acts chapter number three, they would go to the temple and they would praise. They would go to the temple and pray three times a day. They would go to the temple and pray. And they would go praise God. I'm concerned, not you, not you online, but there's an entire generation that asked God to help them win and they feel like they don't have to come to church to give him honor. That's that widening of culture. No, I don't, I don't need to go to church. I mean, God knows my heart, but you still go to the movies. Now, this is not an indictment for you to come to church because some of you need to stay home because the virus is affecting you in various ways. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about those who feel like God doesn't deserve their Sunday. The beach does. The mall does. The restaurant does. Baby, God gives you 168 hours a week. All he's asking you for is two. <laughs> Pastor, you know what? I'm busy. You're only busy because God blessed you. You're only busy because God gave you breath in your body. No, I'm not coming to church just because I'm coming to church because I know that without God, I would be absolutely nothing. I'm coming because God has been good to me, and I'm coming to give him a sacrifice. Your credit score went up 50 points. Now we don't see you no more. God was merciful enough to give you a spouse a partner, and now you got a partner, and you too busy worshiping them. God's like, where's my praise? Give me what belongs to me. Offer unto me what belongs to me. Don't get so busy that you, see, here's the thing. The devil doesn't have to make you bad. He just got to make you busy. You're just so busy. I, I'm so busy. I can't pray. I'm so busy. I can't. Have you looked at your screen time? 
how busy you really are. If you're an Android user, you don't understand what I'm talking about, but, but iPhone gives you a, a, an, a, an allotment of how much time you've been online and stuff like I know y'all don't understand that. But my point is this, how busy you are. I can't pray at Friday at 11 o'clock, but you can pray if you have cancer. You'll pray for a raise. You've been praying that stimulus check come in the mail tomorrow. It's two weeks behind, Nate. I don't know what's going on. I'm simply saying, where's God's praise? The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. I owe God what belongs to him. Now, I'm not saying being religious and legalistic to where you go to church no matter what. My parents would go on vacation, they'd find a church to bring us to. Go on vacation. You don't vacate from God. We'd find a First Baptist somewhere and we'd be there. We got swimsuits packed and they're packing us suits for, for church. We get out, we're dressed up, we're all in suits on vacation to go to church. Because you don't skip church. You don't skip God's house. There's a blessing in God's house. But seriously, y'all, some of us are, we're living our best lives on God's name. Can I put it to you plainly? No music so I can stop talking. It's like I gave you $5,000. This is an example. <laughs> Just be clear, this is an example. I, I gave you $5,000. You go to the store, you spend it all up. You went to the Mall of Millennia. You went upstairs because you're that type of person. Us, us, we go downstairs. You went upstairs, you went, you went to the store, you bought some shoes, you bought some clothes. And then, you, then you decided, man, I'm hungry. So then you went to the Cheesecake Factory, you went and picked yourself up a cheesecake, vanilla bean cheesecake and all. And then you decided, you finished with that cheesecake. Then you decided, you know what, I want to go over to Best Buy and buy me something. Then you went to Best Buy, bought yourself a TV, and then you go online on Facebook or on Instagram, and then you do this. You say, I'd like to thank, I'd like to thank, the, I'd like to thank my grind. My grind is so strong that I was able to go to the mall and buy this and buy that and I'm sitting there scrolling waiting to see where you're going to tag me or at me or something and you don't even at me and everybody's sitting there praising you talking about man you made five thousand dollars yeah I did it myself I did it myself imagine how upset you are knowing that they're flossing on your dime that's how God feels when we don't give him his praise And we all have to be conscientious from pastor to everybody that let's not get so busy that God gets pushed to the side, that we're so busy grinding trying to be world changers that we forget the word that changes the world. Because you can get in this fast life where you're invited into new spaces and places where you feel like, God, I got it from here. I made it now. I don't need you. I got the job. I don't, God, what? I give him when I get to him. Worship, what? I, I worship him when I can. We all are world changers. I, I'm, I'm using my gift. You're using your gift. Whether it be sewing weave, making wigs, that's a gift. Don't look at me like that. If I come down there and snatch that thing off. No, it's... <laughs> Bow your heads, let's pray. <laughs> Father, help us to change the world but help us not skip our home while changing the world. 
Help us to do what's right in your sight. God, help me to pray over my goals and help me to plan, help me to prepare, help me to be philanthropic, help me to remove my prejudice. Help me to be more prepared for what you're doing. Help me to position people properly. It's in Jesus' name.